suppose that's what, one of the things that I've learned over this last two years. It's not so much what you put in an image, it's what you take out. It's just time, that's all. I'll, I would say that to anybody, though, with any sort of photography, really. It's just spending that extra time and not trying to rush it. If, if you only get that one image, if that one image is a banger, you've done your job in that day. Hi guys, thanks again uh, for joining to uh, Landscape Lenscast. Uh, my name is Paul Cunningham and just uh, doing the hosting tonight uh, with these lovely people next to me. Of course, uh, on the left hand side, we've got Steve Stain, uh, who's our YouTube uh, photographer as well, and he does uh, landscape photography. And below there, we have uh, Doug Milne, who's another landscape photographer and also on YouTube. Tonight, we have a landscape photographer uh, who is a full time pro professional photographer. Um, mainly Paul Thompson's a professional landscape photographer and living in Castle uh, Carrick and uh, which is pretty much next to the Lake District and he's really quite close to the Penangs I think. Uh, so he's got the best uh, views, one of the best views in the UK. Now Paul of course uh, is, this is almost of course, well mainly he's an ambassador and does a lot of stuff with uh, case filters. Um, he also does a lot of stuff with f-stop uh, he it goes on the list goes on. Uh, he's doing workshops just now in Tuscany, and uh, that's going on till February. We'll talk about that a bit later. Anyway, about follow you do follow do about follow you do 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 do. We will get uh, Paul here. Uh, so this is Paul Thompson. Paul, thanks again. I have been trying to chase you for a while to get onto this, and thank you yeah. for uh, eventually conceding. <laughs> How are you doing? Nice to be here, pal. Nice to be here. Perfect. Okay. So, Paul, one of the things is uh, we always ask in these uh, podcasts, what everyone asks, and you know what's going to ask, where did it all come from, where did it start, where did the passion start for photography? Just tell a little bit more about your backdrop of your childhood and where photography fitted in into your life. Right. <laughs> well, listen. Like a therapy me. session. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> how long have you got? Uh, yeah. well, we hours, on, hours. On to two hours, you know. <laughs> like last week. So, well, I, I started off as a, I was a forces kid, so I moved around a lot. Right. Oh yeah. At the age of ten, something like that. So my my father was in the air force, so I was all over the place constantly. So I didn't, I never really settled down anywhere. Yeah. Um. <laughs> funnily enough, he he had a camera, and it was an old slide camera. An old, he used to do old slides, so. Nice. It kind of piqued my interest back then, but I didn't really take to it. I didn't do anything with it. I uh, I went to college to do um, basically countryside skills, countryside management, because I wanted to be like a like a ranger, warden type, outdoor person kind of thing. Um, so I did all my college courses for that, um, and then couldn't get a job after it. So it was a case of finding something that I could do in the meantime. I went from do, working outside to working in a quarry, believe it or not, because there oh. was the, I, I couldn't get anything else other than moving abroad, which I didn't want to do at the time. Um, so I worked in a quarry for a while, um, where basically that really made my mental health suffer big time. So... Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I've been playing in bands. Um, I was a musician, still am a musician. Um, so I decided what I was going to do then is start my own business in a music shop. So I opened a music shop. I did that for seven years. Okay. And then um, in 2008, when the financial crisis hit, it wiped that out completely. So again, I was thrown into a position where I had to find something quick. Because obviously by that time, I, I now had a, a family of my own, two kids. Um, so I decided I was going to take up this driving job doing passport delivery, um, just as a temporary thing um, mm -hmm. to, get, to keep me going. And that temporary one-year job ended up being a 10-year temporary job um, oh. <laughs> because I couldn't get out of it. It was just, that's all there was. I mean, it, we're in a position around here, really, where there's not a whole lot. Um, for employment right yeah and again um by the time i got to 10 years um of doing that 
it, the the pressure was piled on for time deliveries and all the rest of it, and it was just it was sending me crazy. To be honest, it was really affecting me big time. Um, yeah, mental health wise, I'd been doing photography as a as an escape from all of that for about ooh, six or seven years. Bef you know, before I decided enough That's was enough. Time, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was just an outlet. It was one of these creative outlets, really, along with the music. That it was a creative out outlet, just to, you know, keep me half sane. So that's when I decided, at that point, I've got to do something that's that's not gonna send me over the edge. So <laughs> that's when I thought, oh, I know what's a good idea. I'll I'll try this photography that I've been doing for the last seven years or so, and I'll try turning it into a job, which is all great. Mm -hmm. Until about a month in, my wife got made redundant from her job at the same time that I decided that I was going to go full time. So it, it really sort of piled the pressure on to, yeah. to get going. Yeah. And, Must uh, have panicked you a bit. Yeah, just a bit. Just <laughs> yeah. a bit because oh. then it, you know, it all falls on you and you're already kind of trying to work out how you're going to make a living from this. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it piled the pressure on. And then, yeah. Two and a bit years later, here I am now. Still, are you, do you feel as if you've actually lived in the dream as a photographer? I, do you know something? I can't complain one bit. Yeah. It's, oh, it's don't don't get me wrong. It's yeah. it's not easy at all. It's it's probably one of the hardest things you can probably try and make a living from. But yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fulfilling. I, I, I see that. I mean the the podcast I've seen you on, Paul. When you you have uh, been very candid talking about that. Especially yeah. in the last um, landscape photographer podcast with uh, the guys Matt and yeah. uh, Tom, you did mention that, and uh, I found that very interesting there because it is a like a wake wake up call mm. uh, for a lot of people who are actually looking to go in full time. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that is a really good uh, thing to bring up. Uh, one of the things, of course, people watching this channel uh, who are probably thinking of it, um, you know, they really need to, especially listen to the podcast you guys done. And if guys, I will put a link to that below the video. Uh, landscape uh, podcast with uh, Matt, uh, Tom and uh, Paul of course, uh, talking about that subject of what it takes to be a landscape full-time photographer mm -hmm. uh, yeah um, one of the things Paul, I just wanted to ask you know, why why landscape, I mean, what, what actually got you into landscape photography why not anything else but just landscape I don't like people <laughs> <laughs> Wait, uh, not at all I'm that... it's funny you know, I like, I like the escape it's for yeah. it's one of those it's it's kind of a double-edged thing because i'll go out and and as soon as an area is like i'm surrounded by people i don't want to be there anymore yeah i can relate oh, to that oh. <laughs> on the same token i'm a social person i, I yeah. like to interact with people but I, it's kind of it sounds selfish but it's on my terms <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, but, but when you quite go, when quite I, right though, I think you know that's yeah. I mean, when you go out for, for photography, especially and especially when you try to do video, the last thing you want is to be surrounded by people because it's it's hard enough as it is to try yeah. and get your thoughts out clearly on video what you're trying to get across, and then you you know infiltrated by hordes of people, it just puts me right off, and I've yeah. seen me sack a whole day off because of it because it's just you know. Do you think it affects? Do you think the the YouTube side of it, the video side of it, affects your photography or you seem to cope with it or help you? Uh, for me, it helps me because it forces mm. me to get out. Yeah, and yeah. Once, once you um, you get into the state of mind where you, you're you trying to get out to put a weekly video out, mm. it forces you out because you're, yeah. you're kind of forced out to do it. And I think yeah. over the last two years, honestly, my, my photography has actually gone through the roof. I, yeah, it's improved so much. Oh yeah, I, was, I love oh, the um, the vista shots you've done with the hills, especially in the you know in Italy with the boys when you went up there. Yeah, uh, yeah. but you can see the it's, you you mix up a more uh, in landscape. I noticed. Mm. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sticking to one thing. I like to kind of spread myself across the whole thing. I, I like woodland. I like big vista shots. I like the small scenes. Yeah. Anything that I find interesting, really. And I kind of always say that to people as well is that. A lot of people say, "Well, how do you get a, a style or a or a feel for an image or something?" And I, and I always say, "It's what interests you, basically. It's whatever yeah. piques your interest. That's what you have to focus on. 
if you're not interested in it, then you're not going to yeah. make an image image from it. Yeah, that's the yeah. point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, what was the moment you know made you want to go full time? You feel? I think it was the point where um, I was. Uh, I've been candid about this in the past about mental health and everything, and I have no problem talking about it because you know I don't think it should be brushed under a carpet. Yeah. Um, when I have my downs, is you know it's really difficult to get back out of, and um, so it was one of these periods where I got to the point where the van had blown up, um, and I was facing big repair bills and everything like that, and I was I was working out costs, and I was thinking, I'm I'm spending more money than I'm making doing this job, so this is the time now if I want to do something with photography, it's the time to do it because you know i'm already at rock bottom it can't get worse than this i can only climb out of it yeah. so that's when i used the opportunity to thought to throw myself into that and it was also a kind of release for me it was a release to get to push myself to be outside that's it some... well also you're doing something you enjoy aren't you so, yeah doing something rather than delivering passports so. yeah yeah exactly to a to a time schedule for somebody else you know people will say well you you still have to drive everywhere. I think, yeah, but it's on my terms now. It's not. Yeah. I'm not having to chase off somewhere. Yeah. For a yeah. time but, slot or a time delivery or. Yeah, but it, but when when you're driving to a location, I don't know about you, but when I'm driving to a location, a good example, you see that sign saying "Welcome to Scotland," mm -hmm. and it's a buzz. It's an absolute buzz. Yeah, yeah. You know, as you're pulling into the Lake District, it's you just get a buzz. You, you know, you just can't wait to get there and. Yeah. You, yeah. And, and just get out in the open and up into the mountains or up into the in the woods or wherever. But yeah. you, you know, uh, and it's it's a good feeling. You know, it can get you. You know, I've drove to places and I felt so low. You know, mm. drive to these places, and you get there, and it's it's a switch, and it's fantastic. Yeah. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and just as well, Paul, with me in regards to um, when when you're actually taking a shot, and I, I, know, I love some of your woodland shots you've done recently as well some cracking shots you got in regards to the atmosphere. Of course, was that in Vancouver Island, wasn't it? So, yeah, I've, yeah the, last, the last year I was lucky uh, enough to go. We've been doing workshops in Vancouver Island with Adam, and then I was yeah. doing, um, we went on a trip to the Redwoods, and it was oh, just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Just awesome. Awesome. That looked amazing, yeah. that did. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Some of the best uh, photography I've had in a long, long, long time. It really sort of... It lifted me up big style because it was I could see another it was like you know <laughs> it's like a you're almost stepping up a level each time and you can see in your photography each time you go to a location you you're actually seeing these images in front of you and you're making images that you're really proud of and it, it's like I could see my progression happening this last year especially because of the places I was visiting and a lot yeah. of it is down to location a lot of it is down to conditions once you've got the the knowledge of how to take a photograph you can only really improve that with conditions and, and location yeah you, you, that's true sorry yeah. go on. <laughs> do you think because you are full-time you're getting that opportunity to choose when you go out as well if you know what i mean you know like you got you got your weekend warriors they've only got them two days to get out yeah. like myself i can get out pretty much when i want and it's 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 improved the chance of getting a better image let's say yeah, you know, choosing does. that that time um and, and that again then it improves your photography you know mm -hmm. just yeah. having the opportunity to get out whenever you can yeah it does make a massive difference yeah because i mean you can look out the window and it, if you've yeah. got somewhere local for example yeah you know conditions are going to be great you can just go yeah um yeah. but it's one of those things as well it, it's quite difficult to um because you're at home and you're working from home and you're looking for things that are making you money, it's quite difficult to kind of, you're looking out the window, you're thinking, oh, the conditions are great, but I've got this video to put together. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know? So, it's, yeah. so you've still got a bit of, you've still yeah. talked into a degree. Yeah. 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 You are tied to a certain level yeah. because you, you've got, you've still got time constraints, even though you're yeah. putting those time constraints on yourself. But you still, yeah. if you don't do that, then I find <laughs> you're not going to get any work done. That's going to, yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got yeah. to kind of, do you, do you find you're working more now and harder? 
or, do more hours now than yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> one of the things I've been looking at actually is because I because I've got an office in the house. Yeah, I don't. I can't step away, and um, yeah. I've been looking at getting an outside office. Yeah, and yeah. Putting yeah. it in the garden, out yeah. to one side, so I can just come out of there and and just have a a knocking off time. I'll, I'll tell you what. I've just I've just moved out the last four or five months. We've had to do the house up by the bungalow because of the yeah. needs, and um, it's only a two bed bungalow. So I I've actually converted this the end of the garage into a yeah. little office. And to get away and to move away from this as well and go back in home, it's massive. I didn't really, I thought it'd be a problem. Yeah. And it's fantastic because you can leave that behind. Yeah. Uh, and and, you, and you, you've also got your own little space as well where you're not disturbing anybody else. Yeah. So it does actually really work. I could, you know, I do relate to that as well. Yeah. yeah, definitely. One of those things, especially when you've got like two kids and they're, they're yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, of course, you, you've got a family too, and that's, uh, yeah. that's, another uh thing in it and um the, the images you're talking about earlier about in redwoods we've got some of these images you've given us and we'll put them up uh in a, in a couple of minutes uh, up on the screen to see show uh the viewers about these uh, images are really nice I'm sure most of these guys have seen this these images uh on paul's channel uh, but we're, we're going to show them again <laughs> okay <laughs> so um yeah i mean guys i mean we kind of talked about a few things and obviously with you are where you're situated in paul and pretty much on your doorstep you're talking about getting to places quickly. When you see the weather changing in the window, you can know you can get to these places fast. Yeah. Um, you know the compositions to go to, etc. How important is that in regards to knowing a composition, where to go to, get there fast because you know the weather the weather's going to, well, the weather changes at the time. How is that important to someone like you who's a full time landscape photographer in regards to the time aspect? Obviously the time is a you know, is, is it can be an enemy to you, Agala. Well, it can it can be, but at the same time, if you if you know these local places, like we were saying before, you've got to be able to manage your time. But at the same time, you could get out for a couple hours in the morning, and you can still go and get those images, yeah, um, and not really eat too much into your day. As long as you've got a good knowledge of your local area, I, I think it's quite underestimated. Is getting to everybody goes to these locations, you know, wants to go to the redwoods, wants to go here, there, and everywhere, wants to go into Scotland, but actually. If you've got somewhere, everybody has somewhere where they've actually practiced yeah. and honed the craft. I've got, I've got a place that everybody jokes with me about is Gelt Woods just down the road. Okay. And yeah. uh, I used that for basically practicing all my photography because it's got mm -hmm. a river in it, it's got woodland in it, it's you know, and I've got basically fells behind me, so I've got hillsides. Yeah. I've I've got everything that I can kind of practice with from here, other than seascape. I'm not really mm -hmm. that close. I'm about an hour, an hour and a oh, half, okay. two hours away from yeah. Northumberland. So that's not bad. Having the no. Do you, do you take your camera down there, Paul, or do you just? Uh, I mean, do you take your phone or your camera? You know, just to practice with, or you, I, you know I what I mean? Always, I always, I always took my camera with me. I always yeah. took because it was all about. Uh, what I was practicing down there was shutter speeds on water and, and figuring out what I liked and what I didn't. Right. It was um, looking for woodland compositions and trying to work mm. out what I liked in a woodland and how to photograph woodland. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's really handy because it's literally five minute drive down the road. You couldn't yeah. get it there really. And I'm, I'm sure, yeah, a lot of people, you know, aren't close to a place like that. I'm pretty lucky like that, but you, I think everybody's got somewhere where they can go. Or have got an idea of where they could go yeah. to capture something in, in certain conditions. Yeah. I mean, I know locally, for example, there's there's a tree that I've photographed loads in different conditions, and if you can pick something like that that you've got local to you and just photograph it in different conditions, that can really help improve your photography. Yeah, I um, believe locals best. Yeah, myself and yeah. I'm in the city, and I've got to travel about half an hour outside the city just to get where somewhere decent. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a there is a lot of um, you know places like Gestorfen Hill, which is a a place in the middle of a city. It's a hill with full of trees. It's pretty much a woodland. It's a large woodland, uh, yeah. but it's in the middle of a city. But it's weird because it can be really quiet. And the next day you go, you've got dog walkers, you've got children, you've got families walking about. Yeah. And then it, it's you've a... got lions, you've got zebras as well through the zoo. Is... <laughs> actually, you know what? It, it does. It's actually on the the prom... Actually, the zoo is right next to Edinburgh Zoo, uh -huh. so yeah. you can actually if you're looking to practice wildlife photography, you could probably get a few shots of the zebras and things there. Um, but yeah, it's that's the pretty much closest place I'm at at Spalt. 
it's about 10 minutes drive for where I stay in Stockbridge and Embra. But yeah, I mean, I, I do agree with you. I think local is uh, the best because you know where you're going, you know the look of the composition. When the well are changed, you can get there fast. Yeah. And that, yeah, I, I agree with that. What we'll do, guys, we'll put some images up. So, Paul, just to start off with this image, can you just tell me more about, you know, the conditions, which we can see in front of us, of course, but just the, the day, uh, how it panned out and how you come yeah. across this composition? Well, basically what it was, this this one area that we chose to go to, because we were, we were, basically what happened is we decided we were going to go to, um, I flew into Seattle, so we did Olympic National Park first. Yeah. Um, of course, when Adam picked me up at the airport, his van broke down, so there was two days lost just sorting <laughs> that. He actually broke down outside the airport as he was picking me up. So it was a great start to the trip. So went to Olympic National Park, and then we were going to go to Oregon, actually, because I wanted to do a bit on the Oregon coast. Um, but we got to Oregon, and it was absolutely heaving with people. It was just beyond ridiculous couldn't get close to anything without people being there so yeah. um carried on going to california and went to the redwoods and this particular location was pretty near to where we camped actually and it was the only location that we were getting regular fog for the maybe three days yeah and every day we went we were getting fog and it, the reason why we we're getting fog because it's right this particular section of woods is right next to the next to the coast and right. what happens is, is in certain conditions, it just pushes that sea fog right in off the coast. Yeah. In the uh, morning so and at night. So it's just, it's just awesome. And the the light rays coming through there. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't really do anything to this image, honestly. It's more or less as was. Um, really? Oh, nice. Yeah. I, I mean, I've I kind of, you look at, yeah, you can see that in the way it's kind of pretty much speaks for itself in regards to the conditions or yeah. pretty much making the image. Yeah, um, and that's it. That's what happens in there. That that's what I was finding. So, so uh, w when I used to shoot Sony, I used to find I used to have to really push my images quite a bit to get them back to what I was I liked, huh? color wise and everything. And and when I started to shoot the Fuji, I'm doing that less. I basically do very little to my images now. But interesting, yeah, definitely. At all. And and, yeah. Um, and with conditions like this you don't really need to do anything it's it's, no. it's done for you yeah i think god's yeah. done the post processing for you <laughs> yeah it's beautiful it, this was uh, just spotlighting coming through um yeah it's nice. just everything the foreground as well just uh, leading you into it and obviously your eyes just drawn to the spotlight uh coming out yeah. to the light rays coming through um but you're just kind of your eyes venturing through the actual trees going through the uh the trees there with the the mist in the background there or the fog in this case it's really yeah. nice um the next one I was going to put up here, and of course, just um, sticking to the redwoods, of course. Um, which I'll get up there just now. Okay. Don't know what happened there. Just kind of went. Yeah, I've, you see, I've rehearsed this, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's there we go. Oh, oh. It's seamless. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I'm effortless doing this. Absolutely effortless. <laughs> this... <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I uh, love the foregrounds. Uh, the backgrounds, everything, the separation there is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, beautiful separation. yeah. I do like how the flowers at the front really stand out against the, the trees behind. Yeah. Mm. Works well, yeah. And we were lucky there because we thought actually we were going to get there and there was going to be no roadies left because it was it was quite late in the season for them. Mm. But, but we were lucky. There was, they were still flowering. They were still coming out, actually, some of them. Um, but yeah, it does make such a difference, especially in scenes like this, to have just that little bit of pop of colour. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this this scene was quite challenging because if you look, you wouldn't notice unless you looked. But if you look down in the center of the image and you look towards the bottom of the scene, there you can see a bit of grey just in the background, and that's actually the road. Yeah, you could. You All right. Really, yeah. <laughs> if I just point the mouse, is it pretty much there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's yeah, that's the there. road. There, yeah. Um, yeah. Still, you. You're, I don't think you. I think until you said that. Um, no. Would never yeah, no, it's there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's there, but that's how close you you are to to where the roadway is, running through the redwoods, and it's yeah, it was just beautiful, just beautiful, and the, Absolutely. the fog. It was just like this for hours. You, you didn't have to rush. It was just you know, it was just like, happening like this for hours. So it was it was just a case of wandering through there and looking for compositions that worked. Yeah. When when there's no fog in there, when it actually dissipated about mm -hmm. three days later. 
as awesome as the place is and as massive as those trees are, it was nothing without the fog, really. Yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing, isn't it? And it's just a, that simple ingredient you need, and especially yeah. in the photography. And it just uh, separates everything for you. Takes yeah, it tidies things up, doesn't it? it yeah, does. absolutely. Um, yeah, it just simplifies everything, I think. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, this one here, which is one of my favourites, it goes pretty absolutely. Well that. Um, yeah. It's the dark, it's the warm tones, it's got everything. It's mm. just got all the ingredients in it. Yeah, and this was just towards the end of the day, so this was getting on for sunset. Okay. Um, so that's why you've got the warm tone in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and it was just coming through the uh, the coastal fog and it, just down actually to the right it's not far down the hill towards actually where the coast is um you could hear the sea below it and um there's there's a certain kind of bird in there actually it's i can't remember what the it's a kind of thrush but it's yeah. got a really mournful tone and i was just spending so long just listening to this bird <laughs> bird calling <there. laughs> You, you, the thing is with a with a place like this, it's easy as a photographer to get caught up in the image. Oh and, yeah, and not actually enjoy the place you are. Yeah, yeah. That's a good um, point. And and sometimes if you've got the time, especially like this, because we had conditions that were lasting, it's it's nice just to actually take it in. Yeah, take yeah. the area in, and I I actually find it helps improve your photography if you if you give a bit of time to an area. Don't just rock up and expect it to happen. Is just to give a bit of time to watch where the light falls. You know, watch yeah. how the conditions are changing. And well, that was that was one of my questions actually. Is have you got some sort of process when you when you're going into a woodland? You know, what are you looking for? Mm. You know, are you chasing the light? You know, you know, well, you just on. touched yeah, but... on it there. Actually, I'm not looking for anything, and I yeah. and I, and I yeah. think. I think if you go into a woodland with a preconceived idea, you're never going to find it. Yeah. I think yeah. what you really have to do in woodland, for me anyway, I don't know if it goes for everybody, but for me especially, is if, if I'm in a woodland environment, I'll I'll try just to kind of walk through and see what piques my interest. Like I was saying before, it all goes back to whatever takes what yeah. you're interested in and what, what you notice that actually works for you. Yeah, and um, mm -hmm. I don't really go looking for anything. I'm just looking. I go if what I was talking about actually on the podcast the other day when it was down to woodland is I, I usually gravitate towards an area that's got an open section mm -hmm. in, the, yes. in the forest, yeah. either edges or somewhere that's got like an open canopy above, somewhere where that light can come in. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's exactly what I do. I, I just try and I've learned that over the years. I've been walking through these dark, dense woodlands and I'm realising the light don't penetrate, things like that. And then yeah. you get to the open bit. I've got a, I've, I've not got a lot round by me. I live in the Midlands. Yeah. Um, I've got one lone tree, which I absolutely love. I've got a mm -hmm. small woodland and I always sort of gravitate towards this little area in the middle of the woodlands that's open. Yeah. 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 Every and I've tried to actually avoid it, and I still end up at that place every time. Mm -hmm. And it's always the place where I put my tripod down and yeah. tend to get a shot. And there's yeah. obviously the reasons there is because that light can penetrate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's yeah. ever changing. Once you get to a location yes. like that, that light yeah. changes, and it can yeah. change the scene. You know, in yeah. a, in a split second. Yeah, I think and it's we'll through, um... yeah. Oh. I think it's a good thing as well to sort of local woodlands is actually go at different times of the day yeah. things like that because of that change as well yeah. which i'm yeah. learning because <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm a morning man I, I get up in the morning i go up in the morning get there in the morning oh. you know um but obviously as the day changes and the afternoon and the different light and different directions you see different things yeah. How do you go about, Paul? Once you've got your location, you've decided where you're going to take the shot. You know, open clearing with the light and whatnot. How do you then go about kind of fine tuning your composition? What's your process? Good there? question. Um, time, basically. So I'll spend quite a time, a lot of time on one composition. I don't just time, you know, turn up and go bang. There's a shot and off with the next one if if i find something's working i'll kind of spend a bit more time to see if i can refine it a bit yeah just moving around see if i can 
it's ba- in forest I, I find a lot of things that are quite distracting like for me it's like sky sky can be obviously oh, yeah. really distracting in woodland um overlapping trees i'll try and move just inches one way inches another whatever it'll take just to try and get that separation um it's just time that's all i i would say that to anybody though with any sort of photography really it's just spending that extra time and not trying to rush it if if you only get that one image if that one image is a banger you've done your job in that day you don't have to kind of spend the day thinking that you have to get 30 portfolio images if you get that one image that really yeah, works i agree with you then yeah, yeah, then yeah. it's been yeah really there's so much you, pressure we can put ourselves that way i suppose do you, do you take an image and then try and improve on that image or do you just try and improve on the composition for that final image if you know what i mean if if i'm in an area that i'm not going back to i'll spend enough time to try and get the best composition i can out of that yeah. area yeah. If it's somewhere I know I'm going back to, I'll maybe go back and try and get better conditions or, yeah. you know, that's the way I would probably work it. It's just mm. depending on how, how much time I'm spending in an area. Yeah. Like, so the Redwoods, I could go away one day, um, review my images on the, on the laptop and see if there was something I could change slightly. And then the next day I'll go and retake it because I knew the conditions were going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. that goes for anywhere, really. If you're close to somewhere, then take that time to kind of review your images and see if you can make these small... It's usually yeah. just a small change. Yeah. It might just be something creeping into your frame that you can... It's that self-criticism, isn't it, really? It's yeah. that, you know, just, you know, being honest with yourself and, and could yeah. I improve it? Or, oh. or you know, you know, or am I happy? That's, that's, that's it. That's as good as it can get. Mm. You know? Yeah. yeah. Or it's a case of, well... Um, is having somebody that you can rely on to give you an honest opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 All too often in landscape photography, we tend to try and do everything by ourselves. Um, Yeah. But I think it's very much, if you you can collaborate with people, Mm. um, it it can be hugely beneficial because you can, you know, ask them for their opinion on an image and you, you might, they might see things that you haven't. Because you're quite insular when you're when you're yeah. reviewing your images, you've got a certain way of doing things, you've got a certain look you're looking for. Whereas somebody has a different opinion, and it, it just you know can really help yeah. you out. Yeah, yeah, you need that, I think, don't we? Even like because we're we can be so not biased in our own kind of work, but we, I mean, I've been photographing in the same place since March, and there's a reason for that because I absolutely love this place, and it's a. Yeah. It's a wild bit of woodland which I found in between Kurt Liston and that's outside Edinburgh, in yeah. Edinburgh. And it's just mainly a hill and it's no one goes there. It's over a fence. It's not private. It's just mm-hmm. kind of like a wild part of the land. And I found myself kind of going back there to the same trees, etc. And taking the pictures of the same trees and then going home again and looking at how can I do that? How can I do that better? Just pretty much what you said there. It kind of yeah. all comes uh, to myself. And yeah. what I've recognised is... Um, been taking these. I've been actually taking for, uh, photos of these this woodland for about since March, right up to well, pretty much December actually, when we had mm-hmm. snow. And I've noticed uh, through the seasons, I've seemed to be changing the composition slightly. I'm moving a bit to the left or right. I'm not actually taking the same shot all the time, so yeah. I'm actually adjusting the composition. I'm finding more. But before I used to just take the same composition in different kind of, um, you know, obviously seasons. Yeah. So yeah, it just shows you like just tweaking, and as you guys say. It's that kind of thing where someone sees it in a fresh pair of eyes, is yeah. it can pick pop, can actually pick out these kind of um, deformities, whatever these kind of things that are actually in the image that you could you could just clean up a little bit and yeah, just kind yeah. of mm-hmm. making it a bit more kind of cleaner, but you know expect the frame, nothing coming into the frame, etc. Yeah. But yeah uh, so I can resonate with that definitely. It's a good point. I think there's a lot to be said there too of you know leaving a fair bit of time between taking the shot and processing it. Oh yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. It's it's quite easy to come home going, "Oh, I took this fantastic picture." You yeah, know what I mean. Yeah. Then you sit down at the computer and go, "Oh no, it's terrible." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you see, I'm guilty of that because I because I do in YouTube. I guess I, because I'm trying to get a weekly video out, I'll tend to come back, and then I do things backwards. Um, I'll try. I'll tend to put the video together first. Okay. That just that mm-hmm. just gives me a little bit of a breathing room, and then yeah. I'll go to the images and and edit the images for the video. Yeah. Whereas a yeah. lot of people do it the other way around, but yeah. I just I just find by doing that 
video first. It's given me the breathing room to kind of switch off to the images slightly. Do you yeah. do your B-roll first and then just kind of work around the B-roll? Is it all the way around just to the story? It and then took just a, a long in? time to get away of working when where I can get things done faster because it used to take me the better part. When I was working, it took me the better part of a week to get a video done. Yeah. By the yeah. time I'd filmed it and edited it, it took me a week to edit the thing. Wow. I've just I've just discovered that. Uh, and I find it very... <laughs> I actually said last week to these guys, I really take my hat off to anyone doing YouTube in any capacity doing photography. It's just so much harder than I just uh, an everyday photographer just going out and taking images for just yeah, yeah. the sake of taking them. But there's so much work putting into it. Yeah. Um, yeah, just going back to the woodland photography part, Paul, and also we'll go to other aspects of photography as well. In a woodland, you know, what was it you're looking for? How do you, was it you're looking for in an image, in a woodland image? What, what what aspects of the woodland you're trying to capture to make, to make that image that you want, depending on, of course, on the scenes? Depending on the scenes, I, I look I look a lot for, like I said, I was looking on the, on the edges of woodland, but I look a lot for um, tunnels. Um, mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. like like darker sections of woodland that lead you through to a section of light. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I look a lot for that. No matter where I am, I look for these things that kind of lead the eye into a certain section of light, and that's why I use the edges of woodland because obviously that's where you get the biggest majority of light. But I look yeah. for like characterful trees, that something that kind of using these tunnels to lead you into something that's interesting, so it's, you know, like a primary subject. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or likes of when I'm, it depends on what kind of woodland I'm in, because it varies from being here in the UK where you've got a lot of hard hardwoods, um, obviously oaks and stuff like that, that have got real characters. You go to somewhere like character, uh, Canada and it's all big old growth trees. So you, your approach changes in mm, those. Yeah. Scenes. Yeah, um, you're looking for smaller differences in it in in somewhere that's got bigger trees you're looking for smaller differences rather than here you've got all of these patterns and shapes in the branches you haven't really got that there yeah so you're yeah. kind of looking to make smaller changes out there and 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 i guess it's um I don't it's it's a really hard one to be honest with with woodland to to describe what you're actually looking for because it can change from woodland to woodland mm. all you can really um look for is something that really catches your eye and and draws your interest and that's usually some sort of character i'm yeah. i'm i'm really drawn to like um fantasy kind of films and stuff like that lord of the rings style yeah. stuff so mm -hmm. i'm always looking for characters basically that's all the only way i can describe it in in the forest yeah yeah definitely and you think uh, don't you away guys you've got group uh the carter tree um yeah uh, it's, it's a fascinating tree i know it's been photographed to death but um i'd love to see it i'd love to go down and see that there if you, no one knows what i'm talking about group is a it's a it's a it's an oak tree it's in where is it again is it so, yeah so i think it's an oak tree yeah 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 where is oh, it you, know, you know what i've walked past it uh huh. And I, I can. It's not a tree that does it for me. Yeah. It's a fantastic tree to see. Yeah, that's Post that's the point. Yeah, for me, it doesn't work. No. So it, I, 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 it just does. So I just carry on. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. There's, there's plenty more characters that do work. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. but you I, you've still got to go there and give it a go. But for me, it just doesn't work. But it's it's great. a tree portrait. It's a tree portrait in a way. It's not. Yeah, really, it is. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, okay. Well, we've uh, kind of covered the uh, woodland photography and, of course, uh, really some good uh, uh, answers as well, guys. And also, thanks, Paul. Now, going to the point, of course, going to regards to um, landscapes. I know I find landscapes challenging. Um, I, I, I'll i say about 99% of my photography is woodland. Pretty much means it's woodland. That's all I do. <laughs> so you're, you're going out to go, you know, actually going out and... How does a landscape reveal itself? And what's the um, aspects of the you're looking for and light or shadows? And you know what type of landscapes you you try to get a vista shots? Is that your favorite kind of shot? Or are you looking just to pick out with a long lens and just kind of like just kind of simplify things? Like more people like to do um, one by one crops, etc., and just try to simplify them, simplify the image. Mm -hmm. Or are you just more like just to get the more kind of big panel, sixteen by nine kind of thing. 
I vary it more and more and more now. Um, yeah. I take a lot of panos. You probably know. Yeah, I've noticed, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got with having the Fuji and it, it's 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 got this uh, pano on it, sixty five twenty four aspect yes. ratio. And it, it just blows me away every time I scroll through them and I thought I don't know why I'm scrolling because I know which one I'm gonna end up on because it just it eliminates so many distractions for me. Yeah. Um usually you're looking through the viewfinder on the camera and you can see there's aspects of um there's bits top and bottom that you don't like mm. in an image. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the only way to get rid of that in an image is to zoom in or out. Well, with the GFX I'm quite limited. I've only got a range up to 200 mil. That's okay. as far as I can go. <clears throat> so the way I, I get past that is to use the crop. Yeah. yeah. To eliminate distractions and get rid of it. And that, yeah. that particular yeah. crop works so well, not only in uh, in landscape, but woodlands especially, because it just eliminates a lot of clutter. And yeah. that's what I've... I suppose that's what one of the things that I've learned over this last two years. It's not so much what you put in an image, it's what you take out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to get rid of the distractions, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The simpler it is, the more effective the image is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've noticed that like, when you're actually doing your, your vlogs, your, your videos, uh, one of the things I do like, and it's great for people who are learning photography, is that you use uh, the actual real-time screen and you put yeah. it up. Um, I really do like it. So much so I've done it myself in a uh, well, mine's um, it's, uh, doesn't it go according to plan? Uh, sometimes, <laughs> which you're probably noticed, but anyway, I, I think that's really good because it gives people a great insight in regards to your settings and also, uh, you know, things like fundamental things like the histogram and things like that. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. it, it makes it adds so much more to the video than just people mm -hmm. just talking to the back of a camera, I think. Yeah, yeah, uh, so yeah, that's really good. And also, you can see how you're putting your panel out, you, how you're actually moving the camera from left to right. It's really a good insight into your composition as well. Yeah. Um, guys, were like you any questions gone. about? I mean, obviously, you guys have, have done YouTube as well, etc. And then one of the things, I mean, how do you? Well, let's just put it this way. Regards to you when you do YouTube channels, etc., and you're explaining in the back of the camera. How do you think that's a quite a good thing doing that? You know, just actually giving people an insight of what you're looking at. Is that something you feel that it works well? For me, yeah, um, yeah. For me, it actually helps with well, me, for two. <laughs> yeah, with, with my photography, it helps me because you've almost got to you're talking yourself into an image, you, you, and you're talking yourself to hold on, this is not quite right. I need to move here, or or whatever, you know. And you, you, you're basically listening to yourself. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and to be honest with you, that really, really helps. I think the YouTube, it can be an endurance sometimes, but I personally, I don't find it as an endurance. I find it as, as a positive, mm. and I enjoy it. I think if you yeah. don't enjoy it, forget it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've yeah. got yeah. these monitors. I've, I've bought a monitor also, and yeah. you know, it's got lots, et cetera, on it, which I've done for years, to be fair. But it, it's so easier to, to, especially if you do macro photography, they're, they're, as you can just tilt the screen, you can look at it, and you can actually... Uh, see, you can frame up your image, expect it the the edges of the image more clearer, 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 clearer. <laughs> you haven't away. even got a drink in your hand. That's the best of it. <laughs> Irish coffee. Irish coffee. Um, <laughs> yeah, same question. What is in that cup? Uh, <laughs> Prosecco, uh, old, uh, old coffee I've got here. <laughs> uh, so yourself, Doug. What about yourself when you? Don't yeah, you kind of do that yourself. I've noticed you've got like that kind of way of. Uh... I have the screen, yes, uh -huh, which yeah. is handy, particularly for me because I, like Paul, I, I take a lot of panos. Um, I should yeah. I should point out, Paul. Now I don't know if you know, but I, I don't do YouTube anymore. I used to, but I stopped. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think we we mentioned this last week, Paul. But uh, yes. yeah, um, but um, I've got my obscene there. Yeah, I. <laughs> but I do you these panos. I know, I know. I, I lose complete track of the conversation. Where am I? <laughs> I'll keep it. I won't edit all. <laughs> yeah. So when I do when I do panels, and I've got one of these screens that I use on the back of the the camera uh, because I use a, a Sony. Um, it hasn't got the the articulating screen that just folds out yeah. one way. So if you're low down, it is impossible to see what you're doing. So mm -hmm. if you're taking a panel from low down, it's very hard to see. 
you know, is that going to match up? Are you getting your thirds right? And what have you, you know? Yeah. But, you know, so yeah, I, I do still use that screen, even though I'm not using it on YouTube anymore. I still use the screen just as I can. I don't have to break my knees, basically, to try and see the screen as, as, yeah, as yeah, most yeah. of it, you know? Yeah. Um, so why did you stop YouTube just as, just as a point of interest? Sorry? What did you stop YouTube for? Just oh, YouTube? just time. Hey, I, I write walking books as well. Most oh, of my right, right. photography is for them. Yeah. Now. And uh, I, it's just, you know, holding down a full-time job, writing the books, taking the photos for the books, um, you know, yeah, all YouTube. that kind of planning and stuff as well. Just, you know, something I had to give and it had to be YouTube. So that's why I stopped. Yeah, yeah. I still get a lot of people saying, "Why are you not doing it anymore? When are you going to do another one?" So I might do another one. Sometime. I mean, you produce these books for us photographers to look at, so we can oh, go to these yes, places after all. Yes. Precisely, yes. <laughs> you can look at the photos and go, "I can do a better job than that's that." A plug. That's a plug. There we go. <laughs> Ching. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, kind of. Uh, I think we all agree that uh, you know using the some kind of uh, monitor or just it helps um, clean up the composition. I think it gives you it gives you time to. You know, actually take time, stop and think. You know, because like we were kind of going back when I first started doing um, landscape photography uh, back in 2012, I used to just, it was kind of like point and shoot kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing. You just get the camera on the tripod. Yeah. And you just, without even having an L bracket, you just kind of have that kind of thing where you can actually use the ball head and mm -hmm. it kind of slides down and you go, how come my lawn exposures are looking all blurry? They're almost like ICM, but not yeah. good ICM. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> and, um, with these, all these aspects, I think, we've just slowing it down, as Paul mentioned. And it could just take anything. It's an extra tool, you know, or even it's something you're unpacking. It makes mm -hmm. you think. It makes you slow it down. Take your time. Yeah. Take, you know, make sure that you're you're expecting things properly. Because uh, one of the things we're all guilty of is, or have been guilty of, is we've seen a composition that would be wild. We've been completely smitten with it. Yeah. And we've kind of, probably, have a, we do expect a frame. We'll check the edges of the frame is one of the first things we do. Make sure there's no distractions. Um, but we kind of just sometimes we can make a mistake, um, but we've slowing it down just that kind of simple thing that we all know to do doesn't make a difference. And I think it's imperative to any photographer in any aspect, I think, in photography. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yes. one, of the, yeah, yeah. one of the things that will really help you slow down as well is using a geared head, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, uh, because you can make those micro adjust adjustments and you're not cocking your, you know, your composition up. Yeah, I did uh, use a Sunway one. I think you had that, Paul, didn't you? Mm, I had Sunway. that one there yeah, for a while. Uh, it was 100, I think it was 150 pounds when I got it. And it was just like, it's just so easier to just actually plan your image better and you can actually move it from left to right and up. And... It took me a while to get used to it. If you yeah. come from a ball head to a gear head, uh, to a, a gear head, um, yeah. you're kind of fingers and thumbs kind of thing, aren't you? But well, then you never go back. I, I find that I'm using longer lenses as well because I've yeah. got more control over it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's and again, I know it sounds silly, but it's improved my photography. The gear head has improved my photography because of that control that you've got. Mm -hmm. and, and like I say, I, I'm probably shooting more with at 100 mil plus than the the 2470 type range. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because I've got that control. I think they're fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I'm shooting longer. Like, I'm shooting uh, more close up shots than I ever used to. I, I, I mean, I, to be honest, I, I was guilty of not taking my wide angle off my camera at one point when yeah. I first started photography. Every, everybody does. Everybody wants a wide angle lens on. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, all uh, the way around though. Yeah, you too. I mean, I, I feel better actually using uh, a 300. Um, I've got like um, you know, oh, like you're just a making me jealous now. 300. Yeah, it's a prime <laughs> lens. Oh, no, no. It's, um... yeah, but you, you've got all them pixels to crop it out. Yeah, well, I mean, all right, I've got the, still so got the 24 uh, <laughs> Of the Holy Trinity, of yeah, the twenty-four yeah. to sorry fourteen to twenty-four even, but um, I've got all the two point eights and they're heavy as hell because it is a DLSR and most oh, of you Nick, guys have got. shooter still. I'm still a DLSR shooter on D850. Yeah, yeah. I use um, which I still love, and I'm just scared to move that jump to take that jump because of all the lenses I have, and yeah. I've got like um, mainly prime lenses I have as well, uh, but I'm just so scared to. You obviously trade it in and get a you know a mirrorless camera and then realize I want to pay a lot of money for the lenses, um, mm. which are quite expensive, I, I presume. So you yeah, a converter for them. Uh, yeah, they're, I'd love to get like just to start off a clean slate and just get all mirrorless lenses. But yeah, you're right, a converter will do the trick in the short term, but in the long term, I like to invest. But one of the things I like about um, the lens I've got, I've got 18 lenses, 
and oh, yeah. I only use about three. <laughs> yeah. I only use three, and this just build up the years. And it's you know that kind of thing you go out and buy things on eBay, and you go, why did I get that? I mean, that, this lens does. I mean, I can shoot this lens pretty much through about halfway through its focal length, and I've got it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I need to move on to get rid of it, sell it all, and get a, for a good price and get a good uh, Z8 Nikon. That would be our dream. Smaller <laughs> kit. Smaller kit, that's what Absolutely. It's easy to carry weight. as well. Save your, your knees. Off. Save your yeah. knees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, I haven't uh, got a lot of choice. I mean, I've but I've basically got um what have I got? So I've got a 35 to 70. I've got Adams 23. Oh yeah. I've got a 100 to 200, and that's all I've got. I've just got the three lenses. So anything else yeah, than that, yeah. I've had it. And I find what I can do, even though I've only got 200 mil, it's only a because mine's just the 50. Mine's the 50 right. H2, so I've got 50 megapixels to play with, but I find I can still crop. I can, If I want that little bit of extra reach, I can still crop in. Yeah, it does make a difference on that amount of pixels, isn't it? I mean, I've got 45 in mine's, and I think the full-frame cameras, I think a lot of people are actually going for more back to crop sensor as well, I believe, don't they? Yeah, similar. So that, it's that yeah. kind of thing. It's not full-frame, is not really the thing as much as it was before um yeah just one of the things i want to talk to you paul and i know we've kind of been loosely talking which has been good but um what was your influences what kind of got you into well not got you into we know what you got into photography but what's the photographers or a photographer that got you inspired by their work and their back catalog whatever that made you want to get more in, in depth to it well, I've been lucky to know Adam Gibbs for quite a long time. Yeah, he's one. Yeah, um, he 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 was one of the first that really kind of pulled me up, and he's actually mentored me quite a lot through yeah through my photography. I've been really lucky to be able to kind of um I've known him for ooh, six years now, something wow. like that, and um I've been really lucky in the, in the ability to kind of say, look, what do you think of this image? How could you improve that? And he'll tell me he's you know it's been great it's really been like having a mentor good yeah. good mate but he's been a he's yeah been yeah. A mentor yeah yeah at the same time yeah, you guys are really yeah. on camera and, i mean the thing as well is like even looking look at your back catalog of youtube videos going back uh when you think one of the videos you're it's not a workshop but i think you're with adam and yeah. you just went to vancouver island and you can see the journey you guys have went on which is really interesting mm. and obviously we out and up to Scotland with the van with that, and also meeting Thomas Heaton, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I liked about one of the videos was when Tom Peters turned up and it was too late to see Tom or it was too late to see Adam or something. Is that right? <laughs> well, he, he came up. What happened was he came all the way up to Scotland to meet to meet us, uh, to meet Adam and I, and Adam was ill. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It didn't get out of the van. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he'd he'd have he'd have really bad migraine and he couldn't do anything but lie down. So it actually ended yeah. up me and Tom went out and did a couple of videos while he was poorly in the van. But yeah, that's that's what happened there. But yeah, he's yeah. he's been as far as the photography goes, he's been the one that I've looked at his work and and thought, oh, how do I create work like that? Yeah, he's a great weekly photographer, isn't he? I mean, yeah, there's so many. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a handful of guys like Adam Gibbs, Simon Baxter, etc. Um, I mean, I like Nick Page as well. I think he's a phenomenal, especially when it comes to you know, obviously storms and etc. I don't know why he does it. Yeah, uh, he yeah. goes into the eye of the storm almost. Um, but yeah, just uh, it's amazing. Some of the the choice we've got on YouTube's uh, is spoiling yeah. for photographers, you know. So Going was, back 25 years, I never had that. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. So apart from Adam, there was another guy that um, when I really first started, mm -hmm. I, I started off listening to a lot of podcasts, believe it or not, because when, when I was driving, yeah. that's how I got into photography a lot. I started driving and listening to a lot of podcasts. And there was, funnily enough, Nick Page was on a, a, a podcast called Improved Photography. Yeah. And it was okay. a it was a US based podcast I used to listen to all the time. And there was a there was a whole host of photographers on there, so I used to listen to those quite a lot to kind of just find out information about photography. Basically, one of the photographers that that was, I think he was on that, or I or I saw him somewhere like that, maybe on a YouTube video or something like that. Was a guy called Tony Sweet. Okay. I don't know whether you've heard of him. An American, um, no, oh, you use basic Tony Sweet. Yeah, I know Paul there. Johnson was one of the original guys, and yeah, yeah, um, was it first photography, Adam? 
Yeah, that's part of um, my photography. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, no, I've not heard him. I'll look him up. Is he? Is he? Is his work on YouTube still? Or he's no, he didn't. He didn't really have a Podcast. YouTube channel. He did the odd tutorial every now and then. Right. Um, and that's who I first learned from about shutter speed and all of that kind of thing. Because he was a he was a nature f- photographer. Um, did a lot with water, a lot in woodland, a lot in you know various places. But he was a he was actually a jack. I find this funny reverting back to the music. He's actually a jazz musician, um, who who turned photographer. And I've found this pattern a lot in photography. I don't know whether you guys have seen it as well. There's a lot of musicians. That's what I was going to ask you. How did you find the transition? Because I'm I am a musician. I'll admit to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, your son. <laughs> I, so is my son. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's. I think what it is. It's the. Uh, it's the creative element. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's it's the making something out of nothing kind of thing for me for the with the photography. It's it's all your own um, creation. It's the same with music. Is is you kind of. I always felt with music. I kind of found my my place with music. I really kind of um soothed the brain and uh <laughs> stopped me overthinking yeah. and all yeah. the rest of it so yeah. it, it focuses kind of like, you i think doesn't it yeah i think so yeah. definitely and i think i find that with photography so it was really a really easy transition yeah and that's 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 one of the pe- people that actually kind of thought oh well i can do that because he was also in the same boat he was jazz musician and went to photography and it was all yeah. nature-based stuff so yeah i would recommend it be look Look up so Gavin Hardcastle was a he's, he plays guitars etc. I don't know. I don't know if he's yeah, a musician. Yeah. But... He recorded yeah. jingles, I think, didn't he? That yeah, was, yeah, like, yeah. What he used to do. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can imagine him doing that as well. Yeah, um, yeah it's quite <laughs> interesting because I think music is like an artist. As, as, as you know, we we love music, and I was I'm always been an album collector. I, I'm mm-hmm. a huge Beatles fan. Um, I love the '60s. I love Pink Floyd, etc. I'm so yeah. into the classic rock stuff, the Who, etc. And um, I think the one of the things is uh, when I when I was doing street photography, I used to go out and put the music in and just start taking pictures when Pink Floyd was on, which could be quite dangerous. <laughs> to Pink Floyd. Come on, <laughs> don't try it at home. No. Um, but you know it's great music, and I don't know if it influenced me, but kind of made me slow oh, down. I think it got me. Oh yeah, great album. <laughs> that is one of the best albums they've done, of course, or the best. Um, and yeah, I was kind of, I think it was uh, Obscure Clouds, I think I was listening to. I think that name is yeah. it. Yeah. And I was just walking about Victoria Street in Edinburgh and going down mm-hmm. middle. And this it was during the festival, Edinburgh Festival. I was taking his, I felt more confident taking pictures. It was mm-hmm. weird. It made me feel like quite cool, relaxed, you know. <laughs> you can blend in. Everyone thinks you're a tourist. Well, yeah, I kind of looked like that. Actually. Anytime there's of like year, this Edinburgh. About, like, I don't know. <laughs> It was kind of like, everyone's a tourist because you know because you've got a camera in your hands you, yeah. you don't feel out this place uh, yeah. especially in Edinburgh or any other city of course but, well, uh, honestly, yeah you've got the best city to be in honestly I mean you could thanks uh, yeah we use I mean you great places down and uh, you guys are as well I mean I love the country more than the city believe me mm. um, my favorite I, I city though Edinburgh my favorite city I have to say Edinburgh. sorry my favorite city Edinburgh really yeah no. I love the place. Absolutely. He just wanted you to say that three times. That's all. So that, thank yeah, you. Yeah. I'll pay you later, Paul. I'll give you that. That's what it is. I'll, uh, I'll send you a bank transfer later for that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> As we agreed. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, we're talking about your influences, etc. And um, I mean, obviously, you've uh, been photographing them for a good was it ten year, twelve year, or whatever? Yeah, it must be at least ten. Years that, yeah. yeah. Um. What? Well, so what next, for Paul? I mean, what what are you actually looking to do? I know you've you've got your finger on quite a lot of things like podcasts. Uh, you're doing a lot of uh, workshops just now, and of course, Tuscany is one of the workshops that you're doing just now. And that's is that February, I think it is. You're going. I've got uh, yeah, I'm going at the end of the month. We've got a week long um, workshop there, and then yeah. um, I'm back for what is it? February, March. Yeah, and then I've got another one in May, which we're back in Italy again, um, nice. doing Abruzzo this time, um, and then. Um, I'm supposed to have a couple in Scotland. I've got a couple in Vancouver. So I'm just trying to basically increase the amount of workshops I'm doing across the year because really, as far as landscape photography and doing it full time is, you really have to push the the workshops and and rely quite a lot on that because, um, as I've said on other podcasts, print sales and things like that, you're not going to make money at. You might make the odd bit every now and then, but you're not going to make a... A living and it's certainly not here i know a lot of the people in the states can do it but yeah 
but not here. I don't. I don't find it's. I find it's a really hard market to push. I am. Um, I was it's doing, actually did market. I think. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it's one of the things is the social media has killed photography. Not you know, people can right click on most images and save as. Although they will get a nasty surprise if they blow up to A one. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I we well, my sister in law had a gallery in the in Old Town in Edinburgh, uh, pretty much where the Royal Mail was. Yeah. And um, I was I was selling images, but I wasn't selling images. If you if you don't mean, uh, it was yeah. like, uh, and this is no word of a lie, maybe about five or six a month, mm. and that's uh, yeah, it was it wasn't really that, but it wasn't really good at all. I mean, I was doing Edinburgh images of Edinburgh. This is when I first started doing photography, and I wasn't ready. And yeah. I did say to her, "Look, I'm not ready." She goes, "No, you'll be great," but she never had the business knowledge of uh, having a gallery open, mm. and she mm. invited mm. a couple of other photographers as well. Um. But the guys were saying the same thing. And I was like, well, I don't feel too bad then. That's great. <laughs> but I wasn't selling <laughs> images at all, about maybe four a month, five a month. I'm lucky. Sometimes yeah. nothing. Um, um, so, yeah, I do. Uh, I can certainly gravitate what you're saying with that. Uh, images, the days of selling images, unless you're doing like maybe um, kind of stock photography, maybe. Would you agree with that? Yeah, do you think stock well, photography is? I think even stock's just... really kind of saturated now as well to be honest yeah of course yeah i think the only way you're going to make any money out of selling images is to actually get yourself a stall set up yeah, in a, a mall somewhere you know one yeah. of these guys with all the all the yeah. prints all set out hundreds of them and just selling them at five or a pop you know so. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah exactly you have to like cut through prices it's the only place yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And a lot of the yeah. a lot of the things other than workshops now is so i focus on educational stuff so i do a lot with outdoor photography guide in america i do quite a lot of con uh, video content for them and then we do image critiques monthly image yeah critiques for yeah those guys. Uh, but you have critiqued one of my images yeah yeah <laughs> we were kind weren't we <laughs> I, was, I, was by, I was behind the sofa i was like oh no this is <laughs> Uh, you know, I really enjoyed it, guys, and thanks for that feedback as well yeah, you we... gave me back then. But um, yeah, it's a good channel. It's good to, um, to watch that. And was yeah, it yeah. the OPG? I think is it. Yeah. There's, a, there's a group you've got in there. Yeah. Um, OPG, people can go to. Photography guide. Outdoor photography guide, yeah. guys. If you haven't heard of it, have a little look at it. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's also, of course, you can go on Facebook and join the the page and the group. And if you want to submit images, uh, they will actually put your images up yeah. and critique them. Yeah. Just so like they done mine. <laughs> but um you know, yeah, was, was, i really enjoyed it it's a good experience <laughs> no no they're really good guys they're they're very candid and of course they're very fair um yeah and your checks um, in the post mate <laughs> 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 yeah so that's that's one of the other things that we uh that i do to kind of it, it's, it's all basically around these few things so i've got like um the one-to-ones workshops um, doing this educational content, more or less more focused on that rather than the actual photography, if you know what I mean. Yeah, maybe. there's so much to it now, isn't there? And you have to up your game in the case of you have to get yourself out there. And it's just yeah. all about workshops. I mean, going back 25 years, people didn't have that. They just basically sold their images, maybe done a, a photography camera club, maybe, at a mm -hmm. camera club. Um, but yeah, I mean, so much now is YouTube. And I do agree, YouTube, I think, is a catalyst yeah, to get yourself out there. And it's not a money maker. Don't go into YouTube thinking you're going to make money because you're no. not, not, no. not, not <laughs> unless you're one of the big boys, which you're really going to struggle to achieve nowadays. But yeah, um... I got a free photo from oh, KNF. Well, there you go. KNF. <laughs> they want me to do a review of the photo, but I got it free, so that, that's that's my claim to fame. Oh, well, there you go. But Sorry? Yeah. What, what actually? What did you start YouTube? That's what I wanted to know. Why really? I started you? Why? Why did you start YouTube? All right. <laughs> um, I wanted to put myself out there more. I, I, I basically, I, I suppose I'd shied away from doing anything in the past, and I, and I'd, I'd come to a realization that nothing comes to you. Mm. You're not, you're not handed anything on a plate. Nothing's gonna happen. Somebody's not gonna see your work and say, "Oh, he's fantastic," and and suddenly you're gonna go somewhere. I thought, well, if I'm gonna do this, I I have to kind of do the the work and push myself out there. Yeah. So that realization hit that I have to do this myself. Nobody's gonna do it for me. And and YouTube was that kind of. I thought, well, I'm really putting myself out there doing this. Yeah. So it was kind of almost like a. A kick up the ass to myself mm -hmm. to, to, to push myself and, and get myself out there 
And once I started doing it, obviously my first videos were shocking. Um, but it's 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 a real learning curve, I think. It's a real place to kind of hone what you do. Not only does it help you focus in on your photography, but it, it helps you be better talking, um, help, uh, better interacting with people, everything really. Mm, um, yeah. Um, thinking about how to put them, put videos together it's just an, it's another medium that i kind of enjoyed working with really that's why i actually went into it in the first place yeah yeah and it's as well with making connections go ahead. Uh, do, do, do you do you sort of are you have, do you have a plan about your video or do you just go out there and do it i never i know a lot of people will have a plan about what they're going to do with video on but i find for me i'd rather go out there and see what i see first and yeah. then i'll and then i'll decide what the video is going to be about sometimes sometimes i don't even know what i don't you know when you come to doing your title and thumbnail and all the rest of it yeah i ain't got a clue yeah. until i've actually edited the video what the video is about yeah because i, I yeah. don't actually go yeah. out with a preconceived idea i don't think well i'm going to do a foggy day today and i'll do it all about well the chances are where I am here, I'm going to be waiting around a long time if I've got a plan to go and do a foggy video yeah. because we don't get fog that often. No. Yeah. So I tend not to do a lot of planning. I tend to go out and um, and see what catches my eye first and then focus the video around what I'm actually yeah. photographing at the time. Yeah, yeah just I mean, to... so, I mean, I've just started in YouTube and it was back in March and it started from a, a guy who wanted to do a short film uh, about woodland photography. He was interested in my images. It was like a five minute film and it was just like basically interviewing me and just taking B roll, etc., uh, through me talking. And that kind of inspired me to, to get into YouTube. But I wanted to do it, but I was just not brave enough. And it's mm -hmm. a lonely place, as you guys said. I remember you, someone said that you do feel kind of you're, when you're out there and you push yourself out there, you're pushing yourself out to everyone that knows you, your family, your yeah. friends, everyone. And it's, you know, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it. You've got to stick to it, you know. As, um, but, you know, I've no regrets of it. I, I mean, I've had, like, questions of myself asking, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I doing, you know? <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's I'm starting to relax a bit more as I do each one. Yeah. Uh, but you guys, of course, you've been in the game for a while, uh, especially uh, Paul there. And, yeah, I mean, does it get easier in the case that you feel that anyone is looking to start a YouTube channel um, I know the the money aspect is not really it comes into it, but when it comes to the the recognition of people getting contact with you uh, through your photography or making connections, do you feel that that makes the difference it for the YouTube help. channel? Yeah, it definitely helps because I think, especially with me doing workshops, not only does it bring clients in from YouTube, but it also gives people who want maybe want to come on a workshop or whatever. They yeah. can already get to know you if you're a genuine person, if you're not one of these people mentioning nobody that mm. puts puts a facade <laughs> on and, and aren't what they appear to be. Yeah. Um, then if you're genuine and you are who you are, then they already know you when they come on a workshop. They know what to expect. They know who you are. They know what interests you. So I think it's a really big deal to to know that. Yeah. For, some, for for a member of public who's maybe willing to invest in you, they they they're already invested in you because they like what they see anyway. Yeah, that's all point in business, isn't it? Yeah. If someone's going to invest their time and their effort. They want to know the the product, or not in the case of you, a product, but they want to invest in you and your time and what you're about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah, that's good. Hi, so Paul, this one here with the conifers, I believe. Yeah. Uh, just tell more about the image, and I love the, uh, of course, the reflections is the main talking point. But obviously, looking the eye just kind of goes right at the back, uh, yeah. with the fading conifers in the mist. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this was actually taken. <laughs> Funny enough, we were on our way out. We we use a place called Big Fish Lodge in Canada, actually, and uh, oh, that's yeah. where we all stay uh, on Vancouver Island, and it's in the Port Renfrew area. And okay. uh, we were just we just not long left, but we noticed there was some nice conditions. And this we were actually I had we had eight people. Yeah, eight people all lined up on a on a road bridge. This is taken from a road bridge. Mm. We went down and parked up and just walked back onto this road bridge, and it was it was quite sketchy, but it was worth it because these reflections were just awesome on on this. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, this little inlet, and it's it's tidal this area. So um, 
this water actually t changes colour during the day. But um, it's it's it was just such a fantastic area. These are all um, red cedar. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. and the the fog was right in. We were actually heading up to uh, one of the old growth forests. Um, but we just we couldn't help but stop. It was just absolutely stunning. So flat, calm. Yes. Just beautiful. And um, so yeah, there's no like long exposure there or anything. You can see that, of course. Just as as it was, there wasn't a breath of wind. It was no. just flat, calm. It was just stunning. Yeah, it is a beautiful shot, and we'll get a couple more up there, guys. Um, yeah, it's just everything. All the conditions are just lined up in it with what you want there. Well, this is it. It's it's back to the you know if you've got the conditions, if it's an, it's easy after that really. Yeah, yeah. But in a gallery of that image as well, just not much post-processing involved. No, I didn't do, I, as I say, I, I do very little now. Very, very little. I, I, an image will maybe take me 10 minutes max now. Well, that's well, interesting. That's, and yeah, I'm just uh, this one here, of course, and it's obviously going to all conditions again. I know it's going back to the woodland again, Yeah, uh, but it's more of a landscape place. woodland shot. I think that was the same morning, actually. That was the same morning, but that was as we were heading up into the old growth forest. Cracking. Um, oh, nice. that was just a long lens shot it was this is my kind of shot i really enjoy anything with uh with mist going through trees i've seen a lot of these type of images in the past and i just there's yeah. something really peaceful and serene about this kind of image yeah so i always i always try and capture a shot like this if i can yeah. and um was that like uh what focal length was that paul that'll be at 200 yeah that's correct you're right out at 200 because it's not like because it's medium format it's not like 200 full frame right. about what 180 or whatever it is very much uh this was on a recent workshop actually on harrison lewis oh yeah and um it was i've i take i took a a pano version of this as well um mm -hmm. but i really loved where the where the two sections of land intersected i thought it was quite pleasing to the eye it almost kind of mirrors either side even though there's two different colors going on yeah same mm -hmm. shape Simple image, really simple. Um, just what sort of exposure time are you talking about there, Paul? Um, I have a feeling that's probably about ooh, 15 seconds somewhere yeah. out there, I think. Yeah, somewhere like that. Ten that's seconds. lovely, just the kind of mist around the bottom of the, yeah. the land needed to say, you know. Yeah, I, I like experimenting when I'm on the coast, really. I, I, I do, I like a I like a lot of texture and detail left in my water usually, but I do try a lot of, um, especially out in Harrison Lewis, I think it lends itself really well to uh, long exposure just because yeah. of the tones. The tones, I think it's more about the tonal qualities out, out mm -hmm. in Harrison mm -hmm. Lewis, really. And those turquoise colours just mm. look beautiful with long exposure on them. Absolutely. That's beautiful. And uh, we'll get a couple of more, well, two more in before we go tonight. And... Yeah, so much. I mean, Paul has sent me lots of images, guys. I'd love to. I'll put these up in the video at the end of it as well, just a little reel, and you can look at. Is there any in particular you would want to talk about, Paul? Um, if you yeah, is there anything you want to you could point there? Going okay. right where you were. Uh huh. There's a sunset shot. That's one. one that one there, I think. That was uh, Harrison Lewis as well. As a belter, actually, as we say in Scotland, as a belter. <laughs> <laughs> that is beauty that's a really I, nice one I did something there that you know everybody tells you not to do shoot straight into the sun <laughs> <laughs> that's something I've never shied away from but uh, no, yeah, yeah. I, honestly I love it because it gives such a glow I mean a lot of people worry about blowing those highlights out and everything when yep. they're shooting into the sun like that but not really a problem you just got to learn to con control it and I usually underexpose my shots anyway a lot of yeah. the time, I'm always shooting a, a stop under anyway, at least, no matter what I'm shooting. Yeah. It's just well, like spray. Shoot. When you're facing the sun, around the sun's always going to be blown anyway. It's just one of these yeah. things. And, you know, it's always going to be pure white. So, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I, I wouldn't worry too much about blowing your highlights on the sun, you know. So. No, not at all. And it, it can, can create a really nice effect. You know, this sort of image for me, I was really lucky with this because it's. I was playing with shutter speeds again, like I was saying before. I like the long shutters, but I also like the um, that re retaining the detail in the water, and that's what mm -hmm. I was playing with here. I was trying to time it with the waves coming in, splashing up to try and give that bit of interest. Yeah, I love so, the sea spray. The sea yeah. spray is amazing, on the yeah. especially on the right hand side of the image. 
yeah, yeah. Just to kind of give some, I mean, give that a little bit more interest in the frame. Yeah, definitely. I, I love the light on the bot on that rock in the bottom left corner as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's so it's got all the greens. It's got the foreground in it. It's just uh, you've got the like the eye carrying on to the sunset. Um, yeah. it's really nice warm tones and the, the clouds as well, did not Yeah, yeah, the clouds yeah. as well there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was I really like this, and it was this this was one of those fleeting moments as well. I mean, it didn't look it, the weather wasn't gra- that great, and then all of a sudden, boom, you got that little mm. bit. You can see there's just that strip, and the the sun just came through that strip and just lit everything up. Yeah, it's kind of equally done as well. It's not if it's kind of scattered about. The, the clouds are kind of lifted. And you've yeah. got that right coming from the bottom. That's really nice. The yeah. one thing I didn't like about it was the way that the clouds kind of went up. Uh-huh. You, know, you see what I mean? It goes from right to left and it almost goes down. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's one yeah. of those things you can't really control unless you're going to warp the image, which I'm not really into. But... Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Definitely. I, I wouldn't worry too much about that. It looks good Never to me. Less, no, it's, it is a, a belter <laughs> of an image. It's really nice. I really like that. Um, yeah, so we'll get one more image up. And Paul, is there anything else that we want us to pick up there? Just to, I mean, there's so much to choose from. So I'll give you free reign, mate. I'll give you free reign. Thank you. Guys, how about you... Um, uh, Steve, are you going to see anything you like? If you can see uh, it, to be honest, all of them. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's just I'm, 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 they're, I'm they're all out. thumbnail size. Yeah, the checks in the post, it. mate. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, this this one on the um, is like a bay with the the light rays coming through. That looks quite interesting. Uh, on the, yeah. the bottom, my bottom left. Oh, Your bottom left. That's, yeah. that's it. Excellent. Yeah, good choice. Let's have a look at this one. Oh yeah. Ah, but yeah. Nice. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, Scalpe. Scalpe Lighthouse. Mm. The red that's, and white. That's Harrison yeah. Lewis this year as well, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah, this was a location that we've been to before that we take clients out to, but I, I haven't, I've haven't. i never shot it from this angle. Mm. Um, and actually, I prefer it because we usually down, if you see the peninsula that's out on the right, uh, oh yeah, that side of the image. That's usually where we we shoot from. Um, but I actually like it better from this point of perspective because you get the uh, that lovely shape of the bay in in the bottom section of the image there. Yeah, yeah that's what drew me eye into it. Looking at it, actually, just that 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 nice shape in the bay there with the light. Yeah, the lighthouse there because I've got I've only seen a little. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, but... Really yeah. lucky, and this was actually on the way out. We were gonna we were heading out, and then uh, all of a sudden this the light rays came through it was it was actually really overcast and yeah it'd been raining and then all of a sudden that's usually when when the best conditions are a lot of people mm. back up when it starts chucking it down but to be honest if you can if you can hold on that yeah. that light's going to happen when it stops yeah just in between the changes of like light and uh the storm lifting in it yeah 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 it's just definitely worth holding on because uh it's this this one I was really really happy with because it's probably the best um, composition I've got of this particular location. Yeah, you can see how much the the lights actually shine up the sea there as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just, mm-hmm. beautiful. Yeah, yeah just, it's really, just nice, really nice. I love the tones of the uh, the moors as well. The, yeah, the reds and browns in there as well as the greens where the lighthouse is. It's it just worked really well. Yeah, stunning very, images. Very nice. Uh, thank you, Paul. This is some great images we've been looking at tonight, um, especially the woodland ones. That, of course, I'm a bit biased because I love woodland photography. <laughs> but no, nevertheless, every single one is a stealer. I love them. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. Yeah. So, guys, uh, thanks for watching tonight. It's been really good. It's been a bit of a journey we've been on, uh, especially talking to Paul uh, Thompson. Uh, his work is phenomenal with regards to the images. We've seen them before us, and you witnessed these images as well. So, yeah. Um, Paul, we can find Paul on uh, YouTube. Uh, you all you've probably seen most of these stuff anyway but if you haven't heard of them if you've been living under a rock just uh look up paul thompson photography and he does offer uh, workshops uh he's got one going on just now which is uh uh tuscany and it's uh i think it's starts in uh, february yeah and first, yeah, first of february it starts i think first of february it starts yeah uh have a look um you'll be uh you know you will really enjoy uh going on these workshops because they you know he has got that kind of time and patience will give you to talk through your images and you know help you out in your adventure as a photographer. Um, but yeah, um, Paul was also on Instagram. Uh, of course, you'll see his work on there. If you want to look for quick thumbnail images, go on Instagram, you'll see his images. 
And of course, uh, he's on all the usual suspects like Vero, Facebook, and so on. This is Paul Thompson Photography. While, while I say that, uh, Paul also uh, does podcasts with uh, two other photographers, uh, Matt Bishop and Tom Peters, which you uh, may have or may have not heard of on YouTube. I'm sure you have. Uh, these guys are quite funny together when they get together. Um, and their photography is not bad as well. <laughs> but yeah, uh, check out uh, these guys' podcasts. They also do critiques and uh, the um, outdoor photography guide. Guide. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. guide and I was going to... You know, I'm I'm getting help here from the the guest. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the outdoor for photography guide. Uh, have a look at that. That's where you actually does critiques of people's images. And if you're brave enough, or if you're not so brave enough, because you shouldn't be worried, but if you really want to get feedback on your images, get your image out there and just get the guys to have a look at and talk about, you know, help you, uh, and also uh, give you a little pat in the back if you need it. Um, so yeah, uh, been great talking to Paul tonight, and of course, and also uh, the usual suspects we've got here is uh, Steve Stain and uh, Dougie Milne. Uh, guys, it's been great. Paul, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Guys, you any questions before Paul goes? Not for me, no. No, no, mate. No, no. Just thanks no. for joining us, Paul. Yeah, yeah. yeah. social bunch you too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> great to meet you all. Uh, <laughs> thanks again for watching the uh, landscape uh, lenscast. Uh, it's been great, and thanks again for Paul Thompson to come on. Been a great to see him as well. Uh, guys, take care and uh, tune much. into the next week's one. And we'll have uh, we'll have a kind of group chat next one. Thanks again, guys. <laughs> Thanks again, Paul. Cheers, man.